spoilers for One Piece or whatever. So it's August of 2023, and this is the month where I made the choice to no longer put off One Piece. I have to tell you about the time Keith tried to deep fry turkey. Third degree burns over 90% of his body. His body <laughs> At this time, I was still a One Piece skeptic because the story was going over a thousand chapters and my intimidation was rising because I felt at this point catching up would be impossible. I convinced myself I could never find the time to actually get into the story and I just kept putting it off, hoping that it would finish soon so I could read or watch it on my own time. But as I was bored scrolling through Twitter, I'm never gonna call it X by the way, I saw the Gear 5 clips. And while yes, I may have been spoiled on this incredible reveal, this is what got me to start the story officially. I mean, it was impossible not to see the Gear 5 clips since this was the loudest the One Piece fans have ever been, and they were getting excited seeing one of their favorite moments finally animated. I mean, I would be too, it looks fucking amazing. I just saw the Gear 5 moments with no context, and I audibly went, damn, these look fucking cool. My little monkey brain loves incredible animation, and before I got into the narrative, I just wanted to bum rush the show and the story so that I could get the basics of it out of the way, and then I could watch the cool fights in the later episodes. What is One Piece about? What? It's a simple question. Hardly a simple answer. Shut my dick. I went to watch the funny Brazilian fight the dragon already. But also, I was encouraged to read the manga more since I was warned about the awful pacing that everyone complains about in the anime. I mean, for good reason. Also, they removed the law putting up his middle finger. That sucks. But like, even then, after starting it, I only got to episode 10, and while it was a good intro with Luffy, Zoro, and Nami, me having the attention span of a goldfish, I was starting to lose interest already, and I think that's just my fault because I just have, you know, little patience. But then... Then, as I was texting one of my close friends who is an avid anime watcher and manga reader, I told him I started One Piece and he straight up said to me, Oh, don't, don't do it. it. You'll get to episode 200 and then drop it. Are you challenging me? So yeah, I also kind of started One Piece out of spite and pushed past 200 plus episodes. Also, side note, I was reading the manga alongside the anime as well so I could get the full experience and so I didn't have to deal with the awful pacing. Dress Rosa arc. Hear me and hear me good. I'm here to double down. That shit is a, a two pack of ass. The f are you talking about? That shit stinks. <laughs> Sometimes it is just quicker to read. But, anyways, fast forward to today and uh, it got me, guys. I'm sorry. I'm a fan now. Look, I even got a hoodie and a necklace. I actually had this necklace in my house for like two plus years before I even started One Piece. I could just hear it calling to me every time I walked past it in my room, hearing only the faint sounds of the thousand sunny and Luffy's laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to make another One Piece video for a bit, but didn't feel too motivated since I felt like I had nothing to add since I'm so late to the story. But after seeing episode 1100 and witnessing the Luffy vs. Luchi rematch, I just had the urge to get out my thoughts on One Piece so far and how this last year has been for me with One Piece. I started all this because I thought Gear 5 looked amazing in animated form, and now we are getting that times 5 on Egghead Island. The anime so far has been really well animated ever since the first episode. Of course, it still has its weird pacing issues, but it's less frequent here, and there's more emphasis on giving the animators more freedom of expression. Hell, Toei is actually even taking two-week breaks more often than normal, giving the animators more time to cook. I did catch up on the manga as well, but I won't spoil too much of that for people who haven't caught up. Last year, funny enough, I told myself I would go fast catching up on One Piece, and at one point, I watched so much One Piece, I was able to catch up to the time skip after just one month. That was a lot of fun, and because of that, I became a fan pretty quickly. I slowed down after that because I was wanting to take my time with the new World Saga since this is where the story opens wide up, so rushing through it wouldn't be that good. And of course, Toei thinks the same way, because the pacing in the New World Saga fucking sucks in the anime. I will never forgive them for Dress Rosa. Please, this is why we need the remake. Well, actually, there's only one thing I can thank Dress Rosa for giving me. <laughs> Anyways, by the time I posted my tier list video, that was when I was fully caught up on the manga and anime simultaneously. I mainly used that tier list video as a way to get on my general likes and dislikes about certain arcs, but I never went into full detail about other things, like reacting to the big moments and going into detail about new characters that I met along the way. Overall, I just never went into my general thoughts after catching up with One Piece, because opinions change and new viewpoints are shown. Because since the story is still going on, a few of my opinions about past arcs have been changing since more and more is being revealed. But 
I'll touch up on that more later on in the video. For now, I want to take it slow here and start from where I last left off from my last One Piece video back in September. In that video, I got out my thoughts on One Piece's pre-time skip era, and that was already filled with a lot of crazy stuff to talk about. It wasn't too hard to get into though, because it was actually pretty easy to follow the story along within that first time span. Because you're learning about the characters, you're learning about the crew members, so there's not a lot of story to really cover. I mean, there's still a lot of story within these first 600 chapters, but even then, it's still pretty easy to follow. The New World, on the other hand... <laughs> Fuck man, where do I start with this shit? So, I'll say this, when I first got to the New World, it did take me a minute to get a jump start into it, because Fishman Island at first, I really did not like it at all. I mean, I don't hate it, but there were points where I was watching it, and there were points where I would get to Sanji's moments, and I would just want to turn off the TV and just not watch the show for a week. Hello, lady! Psych! Hey! The fuck are you talking about? But even with my issues in terms of like character writing and setting, the subtext and subtle importance of the arc is great since a lot of it does come back later on within the story. I mean, this happens a lot with One Piece, especially for me when it comes to my opinions. At first, I'll read an arc and I may not be into it right away due to the lack of enjoyment or understanding, but as the story progresses, we get more and more reveals that recontextualize the past events to give them more importance. So that when I return to those arcs, I have a better appreciation for what Oda was trying to say. I mean, shit. This story is just insane with its writing overall. One Piece in a way can be a story for anyone since it does so many things and talks about so many different world issues that it can be hard to follow along unless you're paying really close attention to the dialogue and the events carefully. It's a story that's filled with wacky looking characters that make you laugh while at the same time having tragic backstories that make you cry buckets. I don't think I've watched or read a story quite like One Piece in a very long time and I don't think anything is gonna like replace it ever. One arc we got Luffy and Zoro acting like goofballs because they don't know how to be pirates and then a couple arcs later we see those two same dudes with two more friends by their side about to beat the bricks off of their other new friends arch enemy who is a giant fishman whose people are segregated against like my god man what the hell this is all within the first 50 chapters then not even a couple chapters later those same silly straw had pirates go to a desert island and save people who were being ruled over by an even more powerful pirate who luffy beats up by using his own blood because said villain has the power of fucking sand like he's sandman from spider-man 3 by the way all this happened within the first 200 110 chapters, or 130 episodes if you're an anime watcher. New World Saga is just nuts because arcs can last for more than 100 chapters now and all that takes place within like 3 to 4 days. Yet within those 3 to 4 days, they discover shit like a kid who can turn into a dragon, a giant elephant that has a tribe of anthropomorphic animals on its back, an island where people are enslaved by being turned into toys, and a whole archipelago that's all filled to the brim with sweets and treats, yet the ruler of said archipelago is a monstrous pirate who has hanger problems. I haven't even gone to yet where you have a giant monster named Kaido who just likes to beat people up and hoping that he could find someone who could kill him. Did Oda really plan all this out back in the 90s? That dude is insane. And yeah, you get some moments of downtime, but the moments the Straw Hats hit the new world, it doesn't slow down for them. I don't think these guys get a proper break until the ship ride between Wano and Egghead, and that only lasts for like a couple of pages. And now we are in Egghead, where shit has hit the fans so hard you think the story is in its climax, even though we got like another year or two of One Piece left. When you read the story, you understand why it's so long because there's so much to cover in terms of characters and settings, it feels like its own huge world that has been built up for like 20 or 30 years before it was even written. And by the way, One Piece is cool or whatever, but if you're wanting to catch up with the story in terms of anime, but if you're just wanting to see the cool fights, just read the manga instead and watch the fights on YouTube because One Piece is not even fully finished. Okay, what do I talk about first? Uh, characters! Let's talk about characters. Besides the already well-known Straw Hat crew that we've loved this entire time, the New World Saga introduces us to many, 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 many different characters. So many, in fact, I've lost count of how many names I've heard in these last, like, five to six arcs. So many with their own backstories and character quirks. Like, when I say this story can be for anyone, I also mean that there are so many wonderful characters here that they all feel unique that watchers and readers can self-insert into these characters. But it's impressive what Oda is able to fit into this narrative, and most of the time he has some really grand ideas to talk about, and it does fit well within the story. But of course, my one biggest complaint for one piece is um <laughs> Don't let your kids watch it! This motherfucker. Listen, this is the last time I'll complain about Sanji, but let me speak. Oda, I don't know what you were smoking that made you want to write Sanji both a caring person and cook, yet also an unrelenting creep. It's definitely a distraction from the story, and while I can't ignore it from time to time, there are moments where it's just full on front and center, and it just makes me cringe. cringe. Of course, by the time the Whole Cake Island arc came around, and I got to understand Sanji more, he did become a better character in my eyes. Of course, a lot of the issues I still had kind of remained, but at least a lot of these moments are easier to deal with. 
sometimes. But let me explain why it was so much of a problem to begin with. I complain about Sanji a lot because he's someone who shows so much potential when it comes to being a good person, but it's ruined with the fact that he's a creep with no boundaries. His pre time skip era wasn't that good, but at least he had these incredible moments that showed how much he cares about people and how much of a gentleman he is. I mean, besides Thriller Bark. In the new world, he can't just hold himself back at times, and this is where my problems started to come about when it was in Fishman Island. Granted, a lot of these problems do kind of stem from Toei themselves, but that's besides the point. It's still part of Sanji's character. It's why I'm glad we got the Whole Cake arc, because that's where he's a lot more reserved and more personal since we finally learn about who he is. And I know, I get it, this is a trope in anime, and other side characters have been just as gross, if not worse than Sanji. But having one of your main characters have this trait, and it's a joke that hasn't changed up since the 90s, I think it's best to think of a new gag and just throw this one in the trash. I will say though, I'm not gonna sit here and erase a lot of his accomplishments, because he has done a lot of great stuff in the manga, but I just can't really ignore when he's being really creepy. It just takes me out of the story a little bit, you know? But hey, he's still badass as fuck, so he's got that. Also, I highly doubt Sanji is fully straight. <laughs> Besides that, I really do like so many of the characters in One Piece, and the topics this story brings up can be really deep. And by the way, if I had to pick any one of my favorite Straw Hats, Robin is definitely at the top of my list. I mean, it's definitely a tie between her, Luffy, and Zoro, but nah, that, that's besides the point. When you see her past and where she came from, you see how much of importance she is to the story and the world of One Piece as a whole. An archaeologist who came from an island of archaeologists where the people were wiped out by the world government because they were learning too much about the Void Century. The government didn't want this history to be revealed so the island was bombed and Robin was left alone for 20 years. Being hunted by the world government and by so many other people so she basically had to go into hiding and not trust anyone ever again until she met the Straw Hat crew. I have another favorite character whose past is just really freaking tragic but that involves spoilers so I'm a way to talk about um him. But even then, there are so many characters that are introduced who add so much to the story, both New World and Old. Side characters that we were already introduced to who get extra backstory like Shanks, Buggy, Ace, Law, Dragon, Edward Nougat, but then we got characters who were previously introduced yet in the New World actually get character development like Bonnie, Beji, Doflamingo, Boa Hancock, Vivi, the Giants, but then we get a whole cast of brand new people joining in like Momonosuke, Dr. Vegapunk, Big Mama, Kaido, Odin, Carrot, Yamato, Kinmon, and so many more. The ones I named are characters who may not be main characters of the big story, but are all leads in their own adventures. When the story gives focus to these people, we get such deep characterization that it makes me think the story is going to follow them now for a little bit. And it does for like a couple of chapters. I mean, hey, this is the same story where we didn't get the full backstory for the protagonist until like 500 chapters in. And when we do actually learn his backstory, it adds so much to his character. Oda's talent at crafting these deep and intricate backstories give so much life to this already grand odyssey. I mean, the new world is a whole different beast in its own. Since we spent a lot of time with the Straw Hats on the first part of the Grand Line, the new world is dedicated to giving more context to the world at large. I mean, unless it's Whole Cake, because that arc was about Sanji more or less, but what started as a pirate adventure to find the lost treasure turns into this journey to find the truth of the world and to find God or some shit, knowing that a God is a leader of the Straw Hat crew. Wait, is that too big of a spoiler? I don't know, maybe you should have caught up like the rest of us. We then move on to Whole Cake, where the arc's narrative does focus on Sanji's character and his past, but we also get a peek into Big Mama's mind and learn about her past as well. It really does build a world up and gives more context as to why the villains act the way they are. Maybe you don't feel sorry for them, but you do understand them more. By the way, in my last video, I did accidentally call Big Mama a giant, and that was my mistake. She was living amongst the giants, and she was bigger than every other average person, so I just assumed, but nah. She's just a really big person. <laughs> That's a huge oh, by the way, this isn't a villain, this is one of the Straw Hat members, Jinbei. I forgot to mention him earlier, because while he does become a member of the crew, he basically is just edging Luffy up until Wano when he actually joins. I know dude was busy with the Fishman Island arc, but he could have been a big help during the Dress Rosa moments, like seriously bro. Still, Jinbei's a fucking G, and his backstory was the best part of Fishman Island, so I love him either way. Because that arc overall, to me, is still kind of mid as fuck, except for the couple of moments. Okay, now, hold on, let me talk about Wano real quick because it was me seeing clips of this arc that actually got me into One Piece but I didn't actually talk about my experience while watching and reading Wano. So here it is. At this time this was the arc that got everyone talking about One Piece. This is the point in the story that does not play around at all. Full on dictatorship going on with the island being ripped apart for his resources so factories can produce fucking weapons and all of this shit so that it can destroy the world and yada yada yada. This was the arc in One Piece where the story went into overdrive mode and it just did not slow down for the entire one 
198 chapters. It's still the longest arc in One Piece and it's filled to the brim with reveal after reveal. Long time characters betraying one another, past events coming to the forefront, and prophecies being achieved like Wano felt like its own sub story within One Piece. Yet it's so important to the overall narrative that you cannot skip it. It literally is so important. This was Luffy and the Straw Hat's biggest challenge yet and it was amazing to witness. Each of the crew members get their moments to shine in their respective fields and it was a spectacle to see. It all led to the top three of the crew, Sanji, Zoro, and Luffy, and how their own fights made it perfectly clear why they are the strongest. Their solo fights were among the best in the series had to offer at the time. While the anime did have some rough spots, Wano only got better with the fight scenes and the animation as it went on. When it comes to the manga, it is a pretty solid arc, but it does take its time in the beginning because it has a lot of like building up and exposition to get through. But by the time we get to the first fight between Luffy and Kaido, it gets really great. I know that there are complaints about the One Piece anime fights feeling a little bit too much like Dragon Ball Z Super, like with the sound effects and visual auras that are present. Because in the One Piece manga, a lot of those aren't really there, but the creativity that's on display in these episodes is still second to none, and the animators are really loving the process. I never fully watched Dragon Ball Super, but I have seen some of the fights on YouTube, and yeah, the similarities are there, but the animations look really good, so fuck it, I guess. Episode 1074 was a near perfect example, in my opinion, of like one of the best modern One Piece episodes when it comes to its animation. It looks amazing, and it's gonna be insane to see the remake get to that level of quality for like almost every episode. My favorite animated moments from Wano were definitely Zoro's fight scenes. All of them were just amazing. Of course, each character's individual fights are well put together, but they put all of their time and effort into Zoro's scenes specifically. The visual flair and the sound effects that play whenever Zoro gets into a standoff keep making it seem like he was the protagonist of Wano arc. Each fight sequence was always satisfying to watch. Seriously, the animators love Zoro in this arc the most. Like, episode 1062 is proof that Toei put all of their resources into this sword dweeb. Of course, a lot of the side characters get their respect too. The arc had multiple different side stories from other people like Law, Kid, Momonosuke, Odin Samurai, and many, many more. So many amazing characters are introduced here and all of them get their moments to shine and it still impresses me how Oda is able to juggle all of these little things and have them all fit together within the narrative. Oh, and before I forget about him, learning about Odin and how he traveled with Roger to the final island was the wildest backstory by far and this is honestly genius writing. Wano has been built up for a very long time. We had hints of this place since Thriller Bark. It had all of this mystery behind it since it was closed off from the world. And as we get deeper into the story, Wano started to feel like the final place before the final island. But of course, me not realizing how One Piece works, Wano in a way is just the final big trial for the crew members before they head to Laugh Tale. Like in the Wano arc, we're still technically in the prequel of One Piece. Like it's just been a very, very, very long prequel. Wano is super important, but it's in a way still treated like a side adventure for the Straw Hats. Ones they are known for going on because Luffy likes to explore, help people, and all over is just taking his time getting to the end of the Grand Line. But this time, if he wanted to help the people and leave, not only did he have to stop two Yonkos of the sea, but he also had to awaken his Devil Fruit at the same time if he wanted to survive beyond the land of Wano. And yeah, he did both of those things. And even after doing all that, he still wants to take his time and find out what else is out there before heading to Laugh Tale. He's in no rush, even after achieving godhood. It's like, that's just how much of a fun person he is. So yeah, Wano rocks. I love it. And once that's all over and the dudes are finally free of Wano, we get to the end and the race for the One Piece finally begins. It's crazy that once Joy Boy was awakened within Luffy, Shanks immediately got this feeling that it was time to head out. Almost like he was waiting for this specific moment to happen. I don't know, we'll probably figure that out later. And funny enough, I actually caught up to One Piece when Wano's final episode came out back in December. And by the way, before you ask me what my favorite arc is, I'd probably say Wano. It was pretty much there as my favorite arc, but in the beginning, it definitely needed time to build up, but when it got good, it stayed pretty consistent. But after finally catching up and getting into Egghead, this arc might be perfect, and it hasn't even ended yet. Okay, so I know a lot has happened in One Piece so far since the start of the new year, but what got me to make this video was episode 1100. Look at how good this is! This episode basically reminded me, oh yeah, I actually like One Piece. I forgot I got into this and watched 517 episodes within a month, so like, I can say I'm a fan of it, I just haven't been talking about it because I've been distracted by other things. Elden Ring DLC. I just want to gush for a little bit on how good the adaptation has gotten in terms of animation quality. Yes, at times the show does drag out some scenes from time to time, and maybe on occasion the animation looks a little wonky. They are only adapting three-fourths of a chapter still. But even then, most of the episodes so far in Egghead have had amazing quality to them. Even an episode where a lot isn't going on has some interesting choices that look visual 
visually appealing. They even have creative ways on extending an episode to make it more funny. The animators are able to get more creative with these in-between moments as well as the fight scenes. And in their own spin on things, like in recent fights, there has been five to six different animators rotating within a two minute time span and all of their respective art styles blend together so beautifully. And before Egghead, I was beyond impressed by fights like Luffy vs. Katakuri, any fight between Luffy and Kaido, Sanji and Zoro's fights as well were all amazing, and even the side characters get these incredibly animated sequences. Like Yusuke's Kid and Law vs. Big Mom, or Killer vs. the Straw Man guy, I, I forgot his name, sorry. Like how Wano was a training arc for the Straw Hats, Wano was basically a training ground for the animation team. Seeing what they were able to pull off here in Wano and then go balls to the walls with Egghead's fights. Two animators names that come to mind are Vincent Chansard and Akirio Ota. Ota and Vincent being just two of the main top dog animators for these past two arcs and the two who primarily helped with Luffy's Gear 5 transformation. Vincent has also been a pretty frequent collaborator when it comes to One Piece's animation. Doing some scenes like for Kaido's past, some fight scenes that included Luffy and Kaido, and most recently being one of the animators behind Law vs. Blackbeard and Luchi's transformation. By the way, this is probably one of the coolest transformations I've seen in a while. Ro pulled up like a demon ready to kill and that's all thanks to this person's penmanship. All of this cool animation goes into the next episode as well. The background art of the city when Luffy is flying towards Luchi, the way the colors all break apart due to Luffy's immense power, like these two episodes are the best I've seen so far in Egghead and it gets even crazier from this point on. Like the anime is in a competition within itself to see if the next episode can top the last one after being universally praised. Toei really stepped up their game and One Piece now has some of the best animated fights in the medium. I'm still excited for the Wit Studio remake but Egghead so far has been so consistent that if the quality keeps up, it definitely does have a chance at being one of the best adapted arcs in anime. Egghead in general might just be my favorite arc in the entire story. Enos Lobby and Wano are definitely still up there but Egghead has been a hell of a ride so far. Like if Wano was filled with so many reveals and revelations, Egghead basically comes in and lays it all out for you on the table. It's crazy how even after arcs like Wano, we're still getting some of the craziest reveals ever. Wano was building you up so you can be prepared for when shit hits the fan but still be surprised by what comes next. It being almost 200 chapters, it felt like its own story for a while. After it ended, we all felt like we got everything we needed to move on to the last island. But of course, Egghead comes around and right out of the gate, we meet the Vegapunks and we start to get so many answers. We even start to get closure for Ohara with the giants coming back into play saying they kept the books that were thrown into the center pool so that the void century could never be forgotten. That's just one reveal as well. This arc is just barely reaching 50 chapters and yet in a short time we get some of the biggest moments ever in One Piece. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a few manga spoilers for a little bit. So if you're an anime only, I recommend leaving the video for a little bit and coming back when I'm done talking about it. Okay, are they gone? All right, cool. So my favorite characters so far out of every one of these side characters that have been popping up in One Piece, my favorite has to be Kuma. Kuma in Egghead, he just turns out to be the coolest character ever and he might actually just be Jesus. Reading his backstory was such a hard task because the horrifying life that Kuma had to endure will make anyone shake with fear and anger. He's from a race called the Buccaneers, which are basically half human, half giant. So he is really strong, but it was never enough to handle the pain. The pain and torture that he had to endure as a young slave are only heard in the deepest pits of hell. He went through the worst pain imaginable and because of this he became very religious due to hearing about the positive and hopeful teachings of the warrior god Nika. It was his devotion to Nika's religious teachings that helped him get through his time as a slave. Eventually he found his way out of hell and he started his new life. After all of that he grew up, got the pawpaw fruit and devoted a part of his life to use his power to heal people by taking in their pain. He did a lot of things to help people, going so far to eventually becoming one of the leaders of the Revolutionary Army. But the hardest task Kuma ever had to take up was becoming an adoptive father to Bonnie, the daughter of his late friend Ginny. Adopting her and taking care of her while she battles a horrifying illness. At this point, Kuma had way too much to handle at the time, but he still kept on a smile all the time because of Bonnie. And with Bonnie, she was going to die at some point due to the rare disease Sapphire skills that she got 
got from her mother, who secretly got it from Saturn. The only way to obtain a cure was for Kuma to sell his body so that the world government could turn him into a mindless weapon for the Marines. With that, a cure for Bonnie would be administrated. But the sad part about all of this is that before Kuma became a robot, he used his powers to remove his own memories so that they wouldn't be erased when he got turned into a robot, but also so Bonnie could find it when she was ready to learn the truth about what happened to her father. It's heartbreaking, and it shows how much Kuma really cared for Bonnie and for everyone else involved. This page right here. It may have come out recently, but it is one of the best pages in all of One Piece. Kuma just never stopped running, and it's beautiful to see. Now this is character writing right here. And then after all that, Egghead basically turns into ground zero. Everything just goes to shit. The world elders come to Egghead to fuck shit up. Bonnie now has access to Nika's power system. Everybody is fucking fighting each other on different parts of the world. A buster call is being sent to Egghead and the Void Century's history is being leaked to the public due to Vegapunk himself. Oh, and the fucking giants return. Specifically, the two giants that we met at the very beginning of the story. Brogi and Dory from Little Garden. What the fuck? This one small arc that felt like a side adventure for Alabasta turns out to be a very important moment in the story. I wasn't paying full attention because looking back at the finer details, I forgot that the Giants actually believe in Nika heavily. And I mean, we got some revelations recently on how Joy Boy might have been a Giant himself, so it kind of makes sense that they show up at this point. And also they were hanging out with Shanks, so that's a third reason as to why they came, because Shanks probably told them. It was clear from the Little Garden arc that before Luffy was going to go to Laugh Tale, he would go and make a stop at Elbath. So the giant showing up for the sun god at this time, it would be a perfect moment to go, and I can't wait to see what Luffy gets into over there. Alright, my short little summary of Egghead is done, and I haven't even gone into shit like Sabo breaking into Emu's chambers, Stussy being a clone of one of the Rook's pirates, and many, many more insane moments. Like I said, this arc is filled to the brim with One Piece's greatest hits. Like, it's filled with story events that have been built up over time, and the ideas are now being fully realized, and it doesn't seem like to be slowing down anytime soon. Considering the Void Century history is being leaked to the world, so much bad is going to happen. Oh, and the world is sinking into the ocean. Just like real life. It's all gonna flood. Okay, manga talk over. Wow. Yeah. One Piece. <laughs> Overall, I love it. One Piece is a really, really good story, and I can't wait to get to the finish line along with everyone else. And I won't lie, it wasn't until 2021 when I started to fully get into different anime and manga. I wasn't blind to the mediums, but I always thought a lot of anime was the same until I saw Attack on Titan. The anime holds a special place in my heart. And if you know about Attack on Titan, then you know that the anime, and by extension the manga, took over the world and was the biggest introduction to anime for a lot of people. It was violent and real, but it was also a story that felt very different compared to a lot of other manga. I did read the manga, and I still like it, but I was also someone who thought the ending was cut short and was missing some dialogue, and I really am glad that the anime did fix this, and it works out a lot better. Either way, I loved Attack on Titan, but this wasn't the anime that convinced me to open up and watch more types of, like, very weird and eccentric anime. Nah nah, that was JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I know, there are a bunch of other big anime that are highly acclaimed that are either longer or shorter, but everything about JoJo was what I was looking for in a story and an anime. And the manga has been going on since the 80s, so you got like an old classic manga that's being adapted to modern audiences, this is gonna be sick as fuck. Araki's art style, the color schemes of the characters, the music references, the progressiveness of it all, I swear, nothing will ever top Jojo for me when it comes to story writing and character designs. I think it was easier for me to get into Jojo's compared to something like Bleach or Naruto, and even something like Hunter x Hunter, mainly due to a lot of these big anime having filler, or if they didn't have filler, they just had concepts and tropes that I really couldn't get past when I was watching them. Seriously, I still don't have context for this clip of Hisoka. I seriously just want to smash him with a brick. Yet, Jojo kind of broke that for me by almost fully leaning into those tropes and then going even deeper by introducing some of the wildest ideas I've ever seen put to a story. This shit was both the funniest anime I've ever watched and yet one of the most tragic ones. It did all of this while also having its very in-your-face style that would probably be obnoxious and annoying to someone like me who was always thinking about the tropes in anime, but it was some of the most fun shit I've ever had. I mean, some anime I really can't get into is some shit like the time I got reincarnated as a slime or 
rent a girlfriend. What the fuck are these, by the way? Who watches the- But no, I started Phantom Blood, saw Sapelli punch a frog, which didn't hurt the frog, but split the rock in two. That's when I knew I had to keep watching. Wait, hold on. I'm gonna list off some other animes I've seen since then, because I do have some good ones that I really do like. Uh, Dororo, Vinland Saga, Jujutsu Kaisen, Dragon Stampede, Attack on Titan, Cowboy Bebop, and Samurai Champloo. Oh, and Chainsaw Man Season 1, but I don't count it because it just started. But, you know, it's still there. That's all the anime I've seen, pretty much. Yeah, it's not a lot, but these are the ones I really like. Anyways, when I finished JoJo Stone Ocean, I thought to myself, you know what? I'll start one of those big animes that have been around for a minute. If I got through JoJo, I could do another one, like one of those supposed big three. I thought about starting Bleach and Naruto, but those weren't really clicking for me. I actually used to watch Bleach and Naruto back in the day on Toonami sometimes, but I think I only watched the filler episodes and those kind of drove me away. Don't worry, I'll give them a second chance eventually, but just not right now. So, I chose One Piece. Because anytime I was on my phone and I saw clips of Luffy doing something on screen, it's either being really funny or he's being the best person ever. Either helping his friends or freeing a country from a corrupt governing body. Also, the memes from One Piece are pretty funny. <laughs> Ironically, that's how I got into JoJo because of the memes. Uh, I guess time is just a flat circle. Also, before I end this video, I want to talk about the question on how many episodes or chapters it takes to get into One Piece. Is it 100? 200? 300? Shit, will it take like 900 plus episodes or chapters to fully get into One Piece? It's a long story, so it's a genuine question that people have. Nobody wants to have their time wasted when there are so many hours in a day. Well, from my personal experience, it did not take me more than 100 episodes to get into One Piece. Nope. It only took me 37, or 81 chapters, from manga perspective. I'm just gonna come out and say it, if you got to this point in the story and still had your doubts about One Piece, I don't know what to tell you. This was the part in the story that made me stay committed to the entire narrative. Nami's tragic backstory and abuse by Arlong is still heartbreaking to read. She was going through a lot and thought no one would be willing to help her. Yet of course, when Luffy is around and if he likes you a lot, he will help you, especially if you're a friend. It's here when Nami is at her lowest. Luffy hears Nami ask for help and only just a few episodes later Arlong was beaten and Nami finally joins the crew. To this day Arlong Park is one of the best arcs in One Piece due to how personal it is to Nami and how after this arc the love that the crew has for each other only grows as time goes on and the feelings that just this moment exuded will be felt until the very end. This walk by the way to Arlong Park is still one of the best shots from the anime. After catching up I finally get why this story is so highly praised by millions of people. It's the top manga of all time for many reasons and when you read it, you're gonna understand why. While it may not be everyone's thing, it was able to resonate with millions of people and has made its mark not just in manga, but in literature in general. I love One Piece, dude, and I'm glad I caught up in time just as the finish line is coming up. It's probably gonna end in like two years. Maybe we'll see. Oda has a lot of gas in the tank. Until then, let's enjoy where we're at in the story. You all have a great rest of your day, and don't worry, I'll start up more anime eventually. Maybe I'll start up Detective Conan? I don't fucking know. Goodbye, everybody.